involve different set of techniques. Um, can you all see, see the, the screen? Uh, we see Zoom, not the slides. <laughs> Can you see it now? Yes. Could you, can, yes, right. we can see it. Great. Thank you. Um, and so uh, the domestication really consisted of moving uh, existing uh, wild, wild species into a new environment. And so there was a, um, an adaptive shift that in maize, for example, consisted of not moving from a branch architecture to a single titular architecture and also having determinate uh, growth with a male top inheritance and reduced seed shattering. Those were controlled to trade to, uh, by loci that were uh, typically quite few and uh, had large effects. And the second approach was uh, mass selection, which was consisted of uh, improving traits with respect to a general genetic background characterized by many causal loci. And so, Selection here was done by, um, by uh, phenotypic recurrent selection, which, consi which consisted of uh, recombination, evaluation, and then selection. That's typical recurrent selection scheme. With, and, and here already we had um, more or less some phenotypic evaluation. Not necessary uh, data entry, but some kind of assessment um, for deliberate uh, selection. Deliberate mass the thing that we would like to make clear is that there is um, that there, there is ongoing innovation in uh, in that first phase. So there is still new species being domesticated, in the sense that there is, for example, uh, adaptations of perennial crops, but also uh, introgression from right well relatives, for example, in tomato for disease resistance, which is well known. Also in uh, in maize, we we work in in the Broca lab. We work on for on Progressing traits for cryptocom wild relatives, which is called RD, and also um, a per perennial into into maize. Other innovations are uh, are from uh, selection by by farmers through participatory breeding when they collaborate with research programs in your in your university, for example, but also for improvement of land races. And so there has been some work um, from Alberto Romero uh, about for, for deciphering the, the genetic variability in, in main, maize land races, which constitute uh, uh, an interesting genetic resource to then use in breeding programs. And so, until, until the, 19, uh, the 20th century, sorry, um, we, didn't, we didn't have any idea about the, the, the actual um, nature of genetic variability. We, uh, even though we selected for hereditary changes, we didn't have a concept to grasp any kind of a re our reality about what makes um, what makes selection, what makes crop improvements. And so, with the um, with the second in the second phase, reading two, we were able to control variability thanks to mostly thanks to uh, genetic theory, and with um, con which allowed for control crosses and. Uh, were actually um, um, uh, analyzed through statical analysis, and most, most, more particularly through analysis of variance techniques. And so, uh, one one basic approach was to actually use uh, rely on Mendelian factors or modelization of, of Mendelian factors uh, with respect to few loci again. And so, um, Mendel, in the end of the 19th century, uh, defined genetic factors. And in model their segregation, and also describe the phenomenon of dominance. And later, uh, in the beginning of the 19th century, epistasis, so complementation not within uh, one particular locus, as is the case for dominance, but with respect to multiple loci, uh, was described by Bateson, Saunders, and Punnett, which made uh, the Punnett square. And so these applications of this kind of, uh, of, of this kind of knowledge. Were, were very important in brain breeding. Actually, the, 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 the gene, the green evolution genes, which, made, which brought about uh, in cultivated varieties 
um, dwarfing genes in rice and in wheat actually were just a suicide that were introgressed. And um, also for m modeling um, major major effect resistance to was done through um, gene for gene hypothesis. We relied on the compatibility between some genotype, uh, a genotype of a particular occurs in the, the pathogen, and, a, and a, uh, a genotype at the, at the particular locus in the plant. And so then, um, moving moving from this approach, there needed there still needed to be a theory about how to integrate uh, integrate multiple loci controlling a particular uh, a particular trait. And a, um, a strong um, a strong contribution was from uh, actually Fisher actually founded statistics. In 1918, and one very impactful contribution was uh, how to model, how to how to quantify even the resemblance among relatives. And then later, um, from work by uh, Siegel Wright, Lush in 1937 introduced the breeder equation, which uh, and, and especially the concept of heritability uh, to predict uh, selection gains from one generation to another. Heritability being the, the proportion of the, the, the variability that we observe in the trait uh, at, the, at the trait that is, that is due to the resemblance among relatives. And so um, in Fisher also introduced uh, experimental design and statistics. Fisher made, uh, founded almost single-handedly the, 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 the very basics of statistical genetics. He, he founded um, he developed experimental designs to control for variability and better estimate what is due to uh, genetic factors or family-wide family variability. And um, the, uh, another, another application of these two key, um, key uh, set of theoretical uh, um, elements uh, was uh, also uh, linear mix models. So linear mix models um, are kind, kind of have a particular status in brain breeding because they were very useful in um, they were really useful for in, in animals, but they, they they happen to be useful in plants as well, but much later. But even then, though, they were useful to actually um, put in a rigorous statistical framework um, the the information about uh, resemblance among individuals, which allowed for um, which, uh, which allowed for a selection based on relatives, especially in animals, but then later in, uh, in, uh, in plants as well. And so again, there is still ongoing innovations in, in print uh, in during in that phase. So um, something that I, I, want, I want to make clear, of course, is that uh, genetic theory is far from being um, over. There is still a lot of work, especially in, like, in two examples are population genetics, but also, um, uh, also, how to how to model incorporate epistasis, both for modeling genetic gains, but also for modeling uh, the genetic basis in general, and uh, to characterize whether or not they are important for a particular traits in selection, depending on the population. That being said, there are, there are also innovations on more uh, practical standpoints with uh, logistical innovations for record <coughs> sorry, to, uh, for record keeping, for example and also for uh, barcoding, so the particular plots in the field. Um, also, um, there, are, there, there is a lot of innovation about stati statistical designs that are more economical than the more typical uh, experimental designs. For example, replicated checks and a lot more genotypes that are scattered through the field. And we would still be able to control for the viability through uh, spatial models, for example. Um, so one one uh, one limitation, uh, one very fundamental limitation in breeding too, though, was the inability to actually mark, uh, observe, to mark the locus, the loci that had any effect on the particular trait. So they would, they would, there, there was a theoretical uh, apprehension of what makes uh, genetic variability, but we would. We did not actually collect data about which uh, the about the particular genotypes at the, uh, the causal loci. 
And so uh, one key technology in that phase was um, uh, genetic, were, were, were genetic marker, marker technology. And in, for, uh, with data analysis, linear regression that allowed us to actually um, represent the effects of those markers on a particular trait. And so the first approach was to, um, to, um, to model uh, just a few sites and their effects on, on, the, on, on the trait. Uh, one early example of, of this kind of, um, of approach was uh, QTL mapping in control populations. By control populations, I mean populations that were um, derived from very, very, very um, uh, particular crosses, um, for example, uh, back crosses or S2 populations or recombination in bloodline populations. And um, another type was that another type of, of, of analysis that appeared later was based on more diverse and generally structured populations which had the advantage of actually um, allowing uh, breeders and researchers to detect uh, causal loci with more resolution. And the practical, the, the practical applications of this type of, of techniques was, uh, for example, marker-assisted papyrus, when we could control the amount of viability that is brought by uh, a donor parent while making sure that there is more of the genetic, of the background genome from the recurrent parent, so the, the, the good genetic background that we want to keep. And um, an, an extension of this, of this type of approaches is also gene parameting, and more particularly marker-assisted recurrent selection, which, was, which is basically like phenotypic recurrent selection, but instead of using phenotypes to evaluate and choose the plants to select, we used um, um, mar marker data. And at, at, at a few loci, uh, generally um, all over the genome. But then, but even then, we could not really account for um, very complex genetic bases. And so techniques later on, around the, the year 2000, uh, la uh, techniques were developed to actually handle many, many loci that were actually tagging the whole genome um, with, with, with great density. And so um, if that was about the first time, um, I think, that regularized regression approaches were used to estimate gen genome estimated or genomic estimated breeding values. And so here you could incorporate a lot, a lot of markers and still estimate their effects even then, even when there were more markers than observations. The key here is to actually discuss, is to actually not rely completely on the data to make those effects, to shrink them to us, or, or, to, or more generally, to actually modify them, distort them, uh, according to some prior, uh, prior uh, distribution about, about the, their distribution. For example, re re regression would, would shrink uh, all marker, marker effects quite evenly, but Bayesian regression will have a more a, uh, a more stringent, a uh, stronger uh, shrinkage strategy. And similar to uh, marker assisted recurrent selection, we would use um, similarly to a marker assisted recurrent selection, we use these genomic estimated breeding values for the markers to estimate, to evaluate the plants and then choose the ones to select. And this, uh, the, the genomic selection, genomic selection approaches proved more useful than marker-assisted recurrent selection approaches. Um, I will, uh, as, as was suggested by uh, Massman and, uh, and Bernardo in 2013. And so again, something that is important to, to keep in mind is that there is still uh, innovation in, uh, in, 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 in this space. And uh, actually there is still a lot of papers about Mark, uh, marker genotyping technology, uh, mark, for example, how to, how to derive markers, now, mo now mostly by sequencing technologies, but also by genotyping methods. And so one, one method that we're working on in the lab is um, the pr practical haplotype graphs, or PhD, which consists, so the, the principle of that, that method is that instead of relying on 
uh, one reference genome and derive the markers based on the difference with that one particular uh, reference genome. We use a set of ancestral uh, genomes connected um, that are and, and a graph that connects the different um, the, dif the different hypothesis at particular regions to um, to then model a a, no, an, a, a, no, a a genotype as a mosaic of haplotypes from the reference population of a reference assemblies or more generally reference haplotypes at regions that we select to be generally conserved in maize and typically the genetic the, the, the genic regions. Another um, other other areas of research in breeding three are the, the type of, of mammals that we use to connect the, 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 the markers to the trait. And the type of uh, you know many innovations are about uh, Bayesian regression methods uh, for better or worse. Uh, it's not necessarily useful, but it can be actually quite impactful and robust, more robust than basic approaches, with the methods like base R, base RC, or base S being particularly promising. Um, also, there are some. Um, also, there are, recently we, uh, we we published about um, how to use functional enrichment, either by uh, information about genomic. Um, evolutionary pressure, reconstruction rate, or genetic regions to increase the ability to capture the viability of our traits and to make more robust prediction, uh, genomic predictions. And also, a, no, a big area of research in, in genomic prediction is how to incorporate interactive effects. So, dominance, inter interactions within a particular locus, but also epistasis and, um, and other interactions of markers, so the differential effect of markers, depending on genetic backgrounds, population backgrounds, and also uh, depending on environmental backgrounds. And so, um, again, uh, this is there was still a, a limitation in breeding tree that motivated a, um, a very strong um, paradigm shift, and this. This limitation is the inability to actually observe real, um, the actual causal side. So we would, by markers, we could, we can actually tag a particular regions that are have an effect or not in, um, in the, on the phenotype, but we cannot actually uh, say for sure what is the actual variance that makes a difference in the on the trade. And um, so here the key the the key technology is uh, genetic transformation, uh, genetic transformation technology. So the ability to, to uh, uh, choose a particular variant and modify it and observe or not a, a change in the trait. And that was, that, that phase also um, relied, that phase will or is relying on, uh, on, on progress in uh, data analysis where we don't use regression approaches necessarily, but also uh, machine learning methods um, for analyzing sequences, for example. And so this, this method, this phase will also rely on, on compre comprehensive DNA sequencing, if possible with a lot of accuracy uh, about the sequences. So typically, uh, high-depth sequencing technologies. And so, one, one instance of this, uh, of this phase was just geni uh, genetic transformations, which, uh, which appeared around the, the 90s. So we're still using this type of, uh, of um, methodology, uh, for example, in transgenic transformation for the development of Bt maize, which proved to be much more resistant um, to the corn borer, European corn borer, after we introduced a particular gene. From uh, from a bacteria. Also, other other very target other transformation methods targeted at particular loci are, for, for example, gene editing, uh, brought about by uh, talents, but also more more recently and more effectively by um, CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And here I'm I'm showing the results from a report by uh, Pioneer, where they actually increased by by gene editing they they increased the um, 
the, the expression of a, of a particular gene involved in ethylene response, which improved by about 4% the, the yield in a particular type of stress and did not deteriorate yield under other conditions. And so this type of technology allowed for um, modifications in the genome without any recombination. There was no, um, there is no, there is not anymore that, that, that cycle of selection, of evaluation selection and recombinations, which, which have the advantage of not relying on, uh, on natural recombination events uh, anymore to actually move a plant from a suboptimal to an optimal at your time. And so a second, um, a second approach in that phase was um, genome would be to actually be able to not to transform just the few loci, but this time just to act on many, many loci simultaneously. And the key, the, the key method here would be uh, genome editing, and more particularly, high throughput editing with um, uh, a very interesting, uh, exciting report from last year uh, by, by, by researchers in Stanford showing that they could achieve, they, they, they could make uh, almost, uh, more than 16,000 uh, edits simultaneously in these populations with, um, with good efficiencies, with, with uh, almost perfect efficiency of edition, depending on the particular uh, protocol that they used. With uh, here, um, they, they showed, for example, 100% uh, uh, edition uh, rate in, uh, at the ADE2 locus. But, and, and so we, we are hopeful that uh, this, this type of simultaneous edit, uh, editing methods are possible also, also in May. Um, but the, the key question that actually will require a lot of computational biology is what are the locus, what are the loci that we should edit? If if we, sh we certainly will be able to edit a lot of loci, but we need to choose a particular set that is more likely to have an effect on the trait. And so, we could use, we could use methods from, um, from reading three to, um, to select those, um, uh, those lo loci that are the most likely to be um, to, to have an effect on the, on, on the trade. But the problem though with, the, with typical linear regression methods that are used in this type of approaches is that we have um, more markers than observations, the so-called curse of dimensionality, which, um, which is revealed through different issues actually. So if you, um, if you use a very simple model that relies only on one, on one marker at a time, then you would have to. Um, then you would you would have the issue of calling a particular a particular locus as the most likely uh, the particular marker as the most likely to have an effect on the trait, but you wouldn't be able necessarily to account for all the for all the neighboring markers, which might have, might, might be better uh, tagging, which might better tag the actual causal causal locus. If, if they even can. Um, another issue with this type of, uh, of analysis that is due also to the fact that we have more markers and observations is the, the inability to, uh, to replicate and more generally the winner's curse. So if we call the most significant, uh, when we have, when we look at many, many markers, we will need a stringent uh, search, uh, significant threshold to actually uh, select those that are the most likely to be to be significant in this whole crowd of markers of markers that we have saved, and the, the the issue typically is that those markers that we select are typically may have a strong effect, but they will also uh, tend to have to benefit from a push from uh, random chance and to be fortuitously I'm sorry um, overestimated and. As a result of that, we would typically overestimate the size of their effects and fail to replicate them, as was suggested by in 2017 on uh, by, by study on, on, on human on human genome-wide adaptation studies. 
And there is no reason to think that it would be any different in other species such as men. Another, so the, to, to avoid omitting variables and uh, not capture the confounding effects due to linkage at other markers, we could incorporate them all together. And but th this, is, this wouldn't be a, a perfect solution when there is more markers and observations because to do so, we actually we need to regularize marker effects to distort them with uh, respect to some values. And all of the methods that are used in genomic prediction would to some extent uh, shrink the, the, the estim estimate of marker effects, um, especially those marker effects that are typically small, which are presumably most of them. And so there would be the, the, the curse of, of, of dimensionality would, would result in bias estimates of marker effects. So it would, we would infer marker associations, but not necessarily actual effects of the, the one the particular loci that we are actually tagging with the, with the marker. Um, so other approaches for that would be to use um, genomic sequences, so which would have, which would bring the advantage of actually assaying the, 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 the genome at a particular region in a, in a comprehensive way. So we wouldn't necessarily indirectly observe markers or observe uh, causal lo lo loci, but we would actually uh, see the uh, sites that are making an effect. And um, this type of um, this type of, of approaches could be uh, could be applied to endophenotypes when we we could select the particular regions that supposedly have an effect on traits such as um, uh, combating openness, uh, TF bind, uh, transcription factor binding, or gene expression. And by using those uh, machine learning methods to mine the sequence, we could detect the sites that have. Um, are presumably the most likely to have an effect on the prediction. And so one approach that was uh, suggested by Catherine Mejia Guerra in, the, in our lab was um, to use a bag of cameras, which consists of just counting keys of length K. For example, G, 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 A is a motif, is a, is a fiber motif of length mm -hmm. 5. So the approach, of the, the, the camera approach, uh, consisted of using those counts um, about different different motifs, and to weight them, the weight the those counts up, uh, in favor of those of those motifs that are the most likely to make a difference between a region that is um, a transcription factor binding site uh, or not, or for or for another application that is a promoter region or not, and. Um, she showed that the, the, the weight of the, of the motifs could be a relevant annotation about the, the propensity of, of, a, of a SNP to actually influence the status of a particular region as, as for example, uh, transcription factor binding site. Um, she showed in, uh, she, she, could, she could show that um, um, weight of eight mers estimated in made could be relevant to actually uh, show the um, um, uh, show which region in uh, in rice could be the most could be likely to be a uh, transcription factor for an homologue of the noted one gene in maize. Another approach that we um, that that we that we use to actually uh, annotate the the sites in the genome that are useful uh, that have an effect on the on particular endophenotypes was to use uh, to extract sequences at the promoter and the terminator regions around the gene and to process those sequences um, to determine whether there was a high or a low expression or a just a, a no expression at all or some expression. And so what uh, Jacob Washburn and Hai Wang in our lab actually did was to apply a convolution a convolutional neural network to, to read the sequence and automatically define as part of the model those multi motifs that were the most likely to have an effect and combine those motif occurrences as, 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 um, as which were um, actually activations from that convolutional neural network 
to determine whether um, there was a high expression or not. And so what they, as a proof of concept, um, they, they could generate um, biological insights about what the, what's the, what are the regions that are the most likely to impact expression or not. And so they showed that uh, the average gradient of a particular SNP with respect to expression according to the MAU, which can be only, which can be simply interpret, interpreted as the effect of modifying a particular site in the genome and on, on the endophenotype dieting mammals. And so on average, the SNPs that were uh, in entrance uh, in UTRs, in 5' UTRs particularly, had a strong effect on, on the gene expression according to the mammal. And that shows that, that suggests that those effects that are inferred through the mammal of a particular site in the genome could also be used to, to, um, to characterize their effect on gene expression. And so another approach uh, that we briefly mentioned is consists of analyzing not endophenotypes with sequence data anymore, but um, high throughput phenotyping images um, at many, many, many genotypes um, with probably methods that are more that with markers or sequence information uh, to describe the effect of particular sites on component traits, relatively simple traits. Um, so one important part of this type of, of analysis would be to, uh, on, on a very, on the very uh, broad image on, of the field, to segment those plots that belong to different genotypes. Um, then we could measure, we could extract features about those different genotypes based on image data. And uh, for example, NDVI, so which is a ratio of, um, of, of light intensity at different wave, wavelengths, uh, could be extracted from for many, many genotypes at once from uh, one particular image. And so um, a report in 2015 showed that there was uh, some good correlation between what you could get from a, an aerial picture from a drone and what you, you, you could get from ground data. And they showed also that those measures uh, of NDVI from, from a drone could be also relevant with respect to predict, to reflect uh, physio physio physiological traits such as uh, senescence index that are useful, um, that are pertinent respect to ergonomic traits, that yield, for example. And so another advantage, is, on, another advantage of such approaches could be to um, actually take many measurements um, throughout the growing season. And even though each single measurement would not necessarily be accurate or very, uh, very precise, um, they would still provide some uh, replications, uh, replications to some extent. In the extent, to which um, you could fit a growth curve uh, for in every genotype um, on, the, on the different measurements that were taken during the growing season. And so parameters from the model that is used to fit such growth, growth curves could be estimated with high accuracy at each of the genotypes. And so in a review in 2019, I actually suggested that methods like uh, logistic regressions could be useful to estimate um, growth parameters with high accuracy, which could be which could allow us to have um, very precise, high irritability measure measurements about physiological components in the, of of, uh, of algorithmic traits. And so here I just showed two two very different approaches where we would have a, potentially a lot of observations and not so, so many uh, parameters in the model. In uh, when modeling the endophenotypes. As, as a function of the genomic sequences, we would, we would have one single model for many, many, many genes, about 20,000 for a given uh, species, and uh, observations from many genotypes on, the, on another direction. So that would probably uh, provide us with enough observations to avoid the curse of dimensionality. Um, for the analysis of pheno uh, high through, high through phenotyping images, we would with uh, with uh, higher level images, we could sample the we could sample many many genotypes 
on traits that do not require uh, so many markers to actually be uh, analyzed. And so here, by the a large amount of genotypes that we actually are saying, uh, we, could, we could also um, avoid this situation where we have too, too many parameters and not enough of the regions. And so if we can uh, then, th so the idea of applying genome, genome editing approaches um, in that new upcoming phase would be to, um, to select those uh, candidate causal uh, variants that we that appear to have the most effect on endophenotypes or component traits and mod and modify them and um, a basic quite basic approach would be to modify those directly and by genome editing to get an improved to get an improved uh, variety directly from a homogeneous background uh, from an existing variety for example. The issue here that is that we we don't necessarily know if the the, the particular site candidate causal loci that we selected will have an effect on the agronomic traits that we're interested in, um, especially if they were if they were the effects were estimated based on analysis of component traits or endophenotypes. Also, uh, we don't necessarily necessarily know which is the right um, the the right allele the, the allele that is favorable at a particular site. So one approach that um, we, uh, we we would uh, we would propose uh, we suggest would be to uh, use those candidate causal causal variants uh, as as prioritized variants to then uh, to then later on uh, analyze their effects in with a high precision and that could be done by using from a, a, a homogeneous background select those uh, variants to modify through a, uh, addition technologies that would not necessarily um, modify, edit those variants with 100% uh, accuracy and under 100% uh, efficiency, sorry, because they would, um, we, we would like to have from a homogeneous background segregation for a, a very limited set of variants that we had selected based on uh, downstream analysis based on machine learning, for example. And so we would, we would have, for example, for just a few uh, thousands or a few hundred even markers that we pre-selected, segregation without any linkage with other, other, other variants. And we would presumably be uh, able to use those markers, those variants in, in that synthetic population uh, for mapping to estimate their effects with higher precision on the agronomic trait directly, or just selection. And so um, there would be, as I, as I, sh as I showed um, during that presentation, uh, there would progress in print reading actually consisted in different phases with different paradigm shifts um, consisting of the ability to better and better um, uh, represent the actual causes of genetic variability, first through uh, concepts in, uh, in theory, then through genetic markers where we would actually tag the causal variants, and then through actual uh, variants that we observe directly and can modify through a genetic transformation uh, technology. But those radical, uh, each, uh, each innovation that were radical and created different phases in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in breeding, in, in plant breeding, were also accompanied by incremental innovations that actually um, um, allowed breeders to move from, for example, fulocyte to meninocyte, or also just, just apply their techniques more efficiently and more accurately. And so there is still ongoing uh, efforts being performed in all phases. And um, as far as the new, the, the new upcoming phase uh, is concerned, the challenge, the key challenge here is to uh, estimate a genetic effects. The effect of introducing a gene or modifying a particular site um, are estimated uh, without any bias from confounding factors, neighboring genes, or any kind of issues like uh, the winner's curve. And, um, uh, having those uh, unbiased estimated effects of genetic um, 
genetic variants, we could um, just prioritize them for regression uh, for selection that doesn't rely on markers that are sensitive to uh, population specific linkage um, anymore. We could so we could use uh, breeding three technologies with just more accurate effects. Um, and so that shows how breeding four could interact with other phases in, uh, in rendering. But also, maybe more, uh, more excitingly, um, those unbiased estimated genetic effects could be used to uh, transform a causal variants, um, either for direct crop improvements, moving from one background to another, presumed that is presumably better, but also to generate uh, populations uh, that are that could be completely new in the way that you wouldn't uh, have viability through segregating haplotypes anymore. You will have only particular sites that are differ from one individual to another, but every, anything, everything else around that particular variant being possibly just completely the same. So we would we will have much more power to detect um, to, to to estimate the effect of those alliance. Um, without confounding. So I would like to close by acknowledging the members of uh, the Brooker Lab, um, so Ed Brooker, uh, first of all, but also Sarah Miller, Peter Bradbury, and Cinta, and also the, the students and postdocs that work on different aspects of this issue. Um, Sarah and Arcadio are working on the PhD. Uh, hi, Catherine and Travis and Jacob worked on, uh, on machine learning methods on endophenotypes. Jacob, Joe, and Emre work on genotype by environment interactions using machine learning methods or not. And also Nick Kazmar from the Gore Lab uh, provided me with uh, uh, nice pictures from, from drones. So with that, I would like to take any questions, but first we need to unmute, uh, to unmute you. All right, yeah, thank you very much, Guillaume, for the comprehensive overview and also perspective insight. So now the floor is open for anyone on the line you'd like to uh, share your comments or questions. Uh, hey, uh, Ms. Yen. Uh, thank you for a nice presentation. Uh, my Question is uh, epistatis or epigenic effect, how they are treating your, or they have to be there in the future. Epigenetic uh, effect? Sorry, can you hear me? So your question is uh, how, how can epigenetic effect be in, be in model, being used in breeding? Do you think a new type of approach? Uh, a new version of breeding is required to tap the epigenetic and the EP states effects. Um, so I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understood. So, uh, so how to account for the epigenetic effects? Is that your question? Yeah, it is. Uh, you think like the, the things that already gene editing and all the technologies and the different they are enough to tap this well, it's a uh, new, really new version of the breeding okay so uh, it's I, it's really difficult to understand but i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna give an answer and hopefully it's gonna uh uh it's, it's gonna it's, it's gonna uh, i'm just just gonna uh share some thoughts that hopefully will answer your question so um, epigenetic, epigenetic effects can be, for example, methylation or um, um, introduction of a particular transposon in a, in a region or histone modification. And those were actually, would actually just be uh, endophenotypes at a particular region that could be modeled uh, based on sequence mining models, for example. So in humans, uh, they are leading, uh, the, the Trianskara lab is leading efforts on this. 
and they're doing a very good job at actually using sequence and predicting whether uh, uh, the sequence at that region is um, is highly methylated, has, has a lot of uh, histone modification, or has uh, open or closed chromatin. And uh, we are we are actually working in the lab. We are actually working on this type of approaches in the is that, 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 does that answer uh, what you had in mind? And the uh, EP stage is in fact, and then people are already talking about like changing the pathways, right? For example, to change the T3 pathway to C4 in the IC1 attempts to change the pathway from a lot of interactions going on and a lot of personal failures. So this is so you, uh, maybe a new. So do you mean, do you mean epigenetic effect or do you mean epistatic effect? Yeah, well, both of them are like complex things. Epistatic effect, did you mean? Yeah, epistatic. Oh, epistatic effect. Okay, I'm so sorry. Um, so, they would be, so they would add complexity to models like uh, linear regression models. Um, for sure, and so, but that could be handled either by uh, fixing the genetic background, work, working on a particular population background. We don't need to uh, add uh, populations. We don't necessarily need inference about marker effects across all populations. If so, we add some uh, complexity, but a way to actually move away from that in typical linear regression models would be to have a population background by marker inter interaction effect. Uh, when it goes with, on, uh, with sequence uh, mining models, such as CNNs, convolutional neural networks, you could, um, to some extent, you would, to some extent, account for epistatic, epistatic effects happening within a particular region. But if there is some trends effect, uh, for example, for gene expression, if there, is some, if there are some trends effects that determine, for example, polymorphisms at very distant sequences uh, that through transcription factor uh, effects, for example, actually modify the effect that you have within, um, in a cis region, then it would it would be difficult to model this, this kind of approach, uh, to, to, to model this kind of interaction. Hi, Guillaume. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so uh, overview, and the and the the non For different do you consider uh, polyploidy and also, like, say, for environment or time theory kind of interaction and how complex dimensions? And then, like, say, for different species, how many cultural uh, variants uh, truly really can be uh, applied by uh, machine learning or this kind of your uh, insight? Mm -hmm. um, so it's always, it's always for pretty, it's always, it's always more, more difficult. There is uh, linear regression methods can be, can be, that were developed in, with diploid genotypes. Can be uh, can be also adapted to uh, tetraploid genotypes, but it's um, it's generally a little tricky. And for um, for me, but like the basic approach is based on linear regression could still be used uh, on tetraploid, for example, in in uh, But um, and for ten series measurements, yes. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we just uh, focus on one point because of time is. In terms of the number of cultural uh, uh, variants for simple species, it's also relatively a large genome or uh, a type of voice. Maybe that also tied up with image asking about a uh, mm -hmm. cultural variant complexity in terms of dimension. Um, yeah, that, that would, that would uh, certainly make things more complex. To what extent, I, I'm not sure. I don't know to what extent a, uh, analyzing a sequence in, um, in a tetraploid rather than a diploid would be more or less effective. Uh, I, you, you could, you, 
could still use a select a particular sequence and analyze their their effect on the, on endophenotypes, for example, and you could still uh, hit re linear regression models on the, on the on the for for to model the effect of a particular site on the, on on traits, but then the interactions like the dominance effect for that for, for those. Uh, um, uh, at, that, at that particular, at those particular side, would be much more complex. So, surely, the, the approach needs to be more parameters. Uh, so maybe um, I, I I don't know to what extent models based on just sequences counting the number of uh, of a particular letter, for example, how many A's are there? One, two, three, or four A's are there? Um, and how many C's, C's, and G's? And then that sequence. Um, presumably, that those methods would be useful, but, uh, but I, I don't know. To, I don't know how much, uh, how, how much more useful, uh, how much less useful it would be with the reference well. Um, the one question from Charlotte is: How do you see the use of AI to identify and edit combinations? And its application in brain breathing. Um, so I would. Um, so artificial I, intelligence, machine learning, and merging. Yes, uh, I, I mean, meaning yeah, machine learning methods that we assume. So I guess um, here it could be tricky because. Um, Recombina you could use recombination at a particular genomic region as an endophenotype and use the, the sequence at that region to actually predict uh, the, um, the, the recombination rate around that region. But um, the, the biology of, uh, of uh, recombination inducers might be complex. I don't know to what extent you can actually just focus on the cis region about particular sites, model the recombination rate at that, at that one site. So um, if we don't, if we cannot restrict um, a given handle phenotype, for example, recombination rate, um, if you cannot restrict to a one, one rather short sequence, it would be much more complex to actually uh, select the genomic regions that have an effect on it. So if you have, if it's not only the this region, but also other regions far away from that site that determine the recombination line, then the models might be very complex. So um, it might work, but it might not be so effective. I, I I'm not sure. I, 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 mean, I don't know so well the, the, uh, the biology of recombination users. So um, so I, I couldn't say to what extent just taking the cis region would be useful. Any other questions? The last question. All right, if not, let's thank our speaker, Guillaume, again. And thank you all for uh, joining today's uh, webinar. And uh, feel free to uh, forward uh, the subscription uh, link for people to start uh, from, personal, uh, from Gobi uh, uh, website for the future webinars. All right, uh, thank you, Guillaume. Thank you. Bye now.